Welcome back to the fourth and final part of this four-part series where we introduce ER 1105-2-101 and provide background on policy and regulations for risk assessments. My name is Chris Dunn and I am the director of the Hydrologic Engineering Center. Specifically in this presentation, we are going to introduce you to the communication requirements as defined in the ER and other considerations when performing a risk assessment. Objectives. The objectives you see here in gray we've already covered in previous presentations. The one that we're going to feature in this presentation is on communication and other considerations, and we're going to identify some impediments to the risk assessment. Communication and stakeholder involvement. All project increments comprise different risk management alternatives represented by the trade-offs among engineering performance, economic performance, and project costs. These increments contain differences in flood risk and residual risk and in local and federal project costs. It is vital that the local customer and local residents understand these trade-offs to fully participate in an informed decision-making process. So what this means is, is if you remember, the risk framework is comprised of three separate pieces. The risk assessment piece, which is where your engineering performance, economic performance, and project costs are developed. And then there's the risk management piece, is where your managers talk to one another, make decisions about how to proceed forward. And then there's the risk communication piece. This is where the managers, the engineers, the customers, the local residents talk with one another to assure that everybody understands the trade-offs between one alternative and another alternative. You understand that your risks between one alternative and another alternative. So it's an informed decision-making process so everybody understands why we're choosing the alternative that we choose. Standard project flood is a term that we used to use in order to design and construct our projects. Our projects in the past might have been built to protect against the standard project flood. However, the SPF or the standard project flood is no longer a valid design target because it doesn't use risk analysis or risk assessment processes. However, the standard project flood may have a useful role for comparing new project proposals with nearby existing projects that were based on the SPF as a check and validation of the floods computed from a statistical frequency analysis. So we want to check, does our new analysis compare well or poorly with the standard project flood? If so, why? We need to address this and need to understand why one project was designed for a standard project flood might be different than a project that's designed for a risk or through a risk analysis. Special guidance. The use of freeboard or other similar buffers to account for hydrologic, hydraulic, and geotechnical uncertainties will no longer be used in levy planning and design. We've already discussed this in previous presentations. Unfortunately, freeboard in the past has been used to essentially account for all these uncertainties, when in reality, your freeboard could be, or your uncertainty could be significantly different than some standard freeboard measure. However, that's not to say that you can't use freeboard when you're out there on top of a levee and you look down at the floodwaters and you say, oh, this levee still has another four feet of freeboard, meaning from the water surface elevation to the top of the levee. You can still report freeboard in that manner. However, you cannot use freeboard in levee planning and design. Risk assessments for dams and levees must follow current guidelines described in other USACE policy guidelines. An evaluation of a levy system for the National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP, must follow current USACE policy and guidelines. We didn't want to have to adjust this ER when those policies and guidelines were to change. And, you know, guidelines can change fairly frequently. Project performance will be described by annual exceedance probability, AEP, which we talked about earlier, assurance or conditional non-exceedance probability, and the long-term risk rather than level of protection. You will hear people talk about level of, level of protection. However, you don't want to use level of protection when describing your project performance. You want to use AEP, assurance, and long-term risk rather than level of protection. Special guidance. Documentation will include an assessment to describe the extent to which the proposed project can achieve economic, resilient, and predictable performance. Where? You'll describe that in the narrative um, in your documents. And that is where you will find uh, the description of residual risk. 
Such analysis will formulate features to manage capacity exceedance and the least damaging or other planned location, or at the least damaging or other planned location. What this means is that we only not only want to develop economic protection, but we want to develop predictable protection. So if our project is going to be overtopped, we want to manage the capacity exceedance at the least damaging or other planned location. So for levees and flood walls, this may include providing superiority at pumping stations or other critical locations. What that means is you may actually have a, re a reduced height in your levee at a certain location so that you can guarantee that when the water starts to overflow, it'll overflow at that location so as to protect other locations. The analysis of these features will consider their contribution to the project's performance, cost, and impacts to loss of life. And that is where we talk about resiliency. So in past, you wouldn't necessarily consider resiliency in your project design. Now you do. So risk analysis hangups. What are some reasons that people don't want to use risk analysis? Well, first and foremost is the design standard paradigm. Well, people tend to be risk adverse. They like to say, hey, I read this in an ER or I read this in an, in an EM and therefore I have to use it. So instead of thinking about the risks, they want to just use what they read out of a textbook or out of one of our ERs or EMs. It can't be done. That's a lack of understanding by the practitioners. And with this course, we're hoping to help you understand how to do a risk analysis or risk assessment so you don't say it can't be done. What is the value added? Or how do we make decisions differently? Well, I think we've seen that we make decisions differently because of the uncertainty analysis that we do and the distributions that we report. It costs too much. Well, I think we talked about that as well. Early in your uh, analysis, you probably don't use risk assessments too much and you don't use uncertainties too much. But as you move forward and you get more and more detail, then you start to provide uncertainties. And so I don't know that the costs really are accelerated that much by using a risk assessment or risk analysis. How do we communicate with stakeholders? We covered that in this presentation through the risk communication part of the risk framework. And how do we communicate to the decision makers? Well, with risk management and risk communication, same thing. We can communicate with them. Sometimes we're our own worst enemies. And even for the well-informed, terminology practices continue to change. And so here's a long laundry list of ways that people talk about risk. They talk about risk-based, risk analysis, risk and uncertainty, risk management, and so on and so forth. Do these things all mean the same thing? Probably not. Not exactly. But they're close enough that the vernacular is used more or less interchangeably. So when you're talking about risk, it's best to come back to the foundations, come back to ER 1105-2-101 to get the definitions on these particular terms. So with that, we have completed the fourth of four presentations in this series. In this presentation, we discuss communication requirements and other considerations identified in ER 1105-2-101. Now would be a great time to capture any questions you have on this session, and we can discuss them later in our discussion sessions. Thank you.